everybody. Hello, everybody watching my Facebook and YouTube. My friend Silvia. Hola, Silvia. Como te quiero mucho. I'm going to go ahead and open up this prayer real quick, guys. Heavenly Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as I bring forth your word. Lord, I ask that the words coming out of my mouth, Heavenly Father, will be yours and not mine. Lord, he gave me this message, Heavenly Father, to bring to your people. Now help me bring it forward, Heavenly Father, with the honor and respect and the dignity that you deserve. Lord, I give you all the honor, praise, and glory, Lord, for everything in my life, Heavenly Father, good and bad, Lord, because everything comes through your hand and you know best. I love you so much, Abba, Father. I love you with all of my heart. Search my heart and all that I love you, Heavenly Father. If there's anything in this message that you need to change, Abba, Father, you know that you have total control. I have surrendered that to you, Lord. I'm no longer mine, Lord. I love you. I praise you. And I give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So today is a special day for me. Because today would have been my daddy's birthday. He would have been 104 years old. Wow. He's probably up there with Moses and Noah and Abraham. And they're chatting about the good old days. <laughs> My daddy was so amazing. I was daddy's girl, and, and I was, we were talking, me and Pastor were talking in his office earlier, and I told him it was amazing. When I was a little girl, me and my dad would sneak away to pay bills, and we would end up at the Dairy Queen somehow, and, and so he would always treat me a Dairy Queen, and then once I got my first job, then it was, a, it was nice to be able to treat him to Dairy Queen, you know, and, so it's amazing because when he used to treat me, it was ice cream cones, and then when I began to treat him, it was banana spits. I don't know how that works, but okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I used to have to bribe him at a steakhouse, take him to a steakhouse just so I could get him to his doctor's appointment. So it was pretty expensive to keep my dad going to his doctor's appointments. <laughs> But you know what? You only have one set of parents. Amen. You appreciate them and you love them. You know what? Because we didn't see everything they did for us when we were babies, but just the fact that our mama chose life. Amen. And that our daddy worked hard so that we would have a roof over our head and food on the table. And they were up countless nights when we were teething and when we were sick. We see all those things we don't see. So sometimes it's kind of hard as adults. Because we get to the age of 12 and we think we know everything, right? Yeah. And then we forget that our parents are human beings and they gave up a lot of hopes and dreams in their lives and sacrificed to raise us and mm -hmm. we can never forget that. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even in my notes, but I guess the Lord wanted somebody to know that. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> so another thing that I would do with my dad... When I was a little girl, was we used to go to Laguna Pueblo to Brands and to Gallup. We used to go because my dad would help the native people of the Pueblo round up wild stockings. And, uh, and he used to take me with him sometimes, but I'd have to stay in the truck and watch. He wouldn't let me get down. And they used to corner him into a corner of the canyon. And then they would take the, all the horses and they would kind of push them in a way, if you will, to where they would go into the corral. And it was something amazing to see. Those horses were so beautiful. So beautiful. Um, I remember when, as they would take all the horses into the corral, there, there would be a huge barn. There would be a huge barn, and then there would be a corral on the outside where the horses could run free. Well, in the, in the, in the barn, they would have bales and bales of hay, and outside they would have these huge troughs of water, fresh clean water for the horses. So the horses would get round up and they would they would go into the corral, but then if it rained they had, you know, the barn that they could go into and they had water and they had food. So this would this would take place for a couple of weeks. They would gather the horses that would be in there, my dad would be, be back in a couple of days. My dad had his own way of breaking in horses. And they really admired him for it because my dad, throughout the days, he would come and he would feed the horses carrots, apples, sugar cubes. 
And, uh, and until the horses begin to know him and get comfortable. I remember when our little red truck would drive up and the horses would see that it was my dad, they would all come from outside the barn and they would line up on the side of the corral because they knew that there was sweet carrots and yeah, but I didn't eat them all the way over there, but sometimes there would be sweet carrots because I love carrots, but there was always sugar cubes and stuff. And, and it was amazing. I remember the first time my dad had me feed one of the horses a sugar cube. I was so afraid. Is have these little teeth, you know, my little tiny hand, and I'm holding a sugar cube, and, and so gently the horse would just come and take it. He would just take it from my hand, and it was just amazing. And uh, so I remember over, over and over we go as my, until my dad gained their trust. Once he gained their trust, then he would be, begin to go into the corral. Most of them would be locked in the barn, and there would only be one left outside. And that was going to be the one horse that day that my dad was going to try to break in. And it was just so amazing. It was scary at the same time. But when you're a little girl, it's kind of funny when your daddy keeps falling off a horse. <laughs> and he gets up and then he keeps falling off and he gets up. And so it would just be, I don't know why you like this job. That horse keeps throwing you off. And it's like, because I'm trying to break it in. So my dad was explaining the process to me and stuff. And I would tell him, Dad, why do you break them in? What's the purpose? And he would say, because until they're broken, sweetheart, they're no good to us. No. Until, until they surrender their will to us, we can't use them for what the farmers need to use them for. Mm. So my dad began to explain this to me. Then my dad would slowly approach the horse and attempt to put the saddle on the horse and to mount it, to saddle break it. The horse would buck so hard at times that my dad would get thrown off, but he would keep getting up until he would break the horse. And then my dad would begin to ride the horse and teach the horse certain things. He would teach it how to let my dad steer it, to stop, and to respond to cues and commands when they were given using the reins, the leg, and the seat. So as my dad began to break in these horses, and because they already knew him, and they knew his voice. See, when my dad would get off of the truck every time we'd go, he had this whistle, and he would whistle. Then the horses would come, they would line up, they'd get their carriage to sugar and everything, but then he began to get their trust. And then as he would go into the crowd with a rope, it wasn't so bad. My dad would gently walk towards him and put a rope over the neck, and then they would start bucking and jumping and kicking. But my dad had a really special way with horses. When he was a little boy, he was raised in Mexico and he was raised in a ranch. Um, my daddy is part of the Yaqui tribe from Durango, Mexico. So I mean, my dad has special way with horses. But he would teach his horses commands that they needed to know. And this is what my dad taught me, that there are four kinds of horses. The broke horse that is considered safe to ride. Once a horse yields and, and it is broken, then it's considered safe to ride because there's certain ones that, I mean, once you break them, they just become really gentle and you're able to ride them. And my dad wouldn't have any trouble. And then there was the green broke horse. It's only partially trained and may not be safe to ride because they still have bad habits. Simply, they simply do not understand commands and you must approach them cautiously. Only experienced riders can ride them. So those two kind, there was those two kinds of horses. So there was the one that would get broke, and then and then he was useful. After a couple of days he'd be useful in, in the farm. And then there was the one that was green broke, and he was broke. My dad would be able to ride him. But still, once in a while, he would walk or wouldn't listen to a command that my dad would give him, or my dad could write him, but not anybody else. It would take a while for somebody else to write him. And then there's the dangerous horse. And I meant three horses, sorry, not four types. The dangerous horse is a horse that was never trained properly and have a very, they have very bad and dangerous habits such as bolting, bucking, and rearing. This kind of horse is considered too great of a risk to train even by an experienced trainer. 
This kind of horse is never fully broken. This kind of horse doesn't mind its owner putting a roof over his head, feeding him, and giving him clean water to drink, but it just does not want his owner on his back. King David wrote a prayer of repentance after he had sinned with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. So let's go to Psalms 51. <laughs> While you guys get to Psalms 51, I'm going to quickly tell you that I remember one time, and I believe it was in Laguna, my dad rounded up this beautiful stallion. I had never seen a horse this beautiful. It was like in between brown and red, but it was so dark, it was almost burgundy, and it, it was just so shiny and beautiful, and I remember it just being so wild that it would stand on its hind legs, and just, just beautiful. And I remember going to my dad, and I, I pulled on a shirt, and I was crying. I said, Daddy, don't break this one. And he said, sweetheart, that's what the horses are for. I said, Daddy, please, not this one. It's too beautiful, Daddy. Don't break it. Don't break it, Daddy. Please, look at how beautiful it is. I said, well, if you break it, it's not going to be that beautiful anymore. My dad took that horse into the barn, and he came out with another one. And I didn't see it, but I heard a couple of days later my dad let that horse go. I wish I could have seen it one more time, but it was the most beautiful horse I had ever seen in my life. So let's go to Psalms 51. It's called The Prayer of Repentance by King David. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, and according to the multitudes of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Take, make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot off my iniquities. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness, O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion and build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, and then they shall offer bulls on your altar. See, David wrote this after he had sinned with Bathsheba, but the prophet Nathan came and had a message for David from the Lord. But see, the Lord, the King David repented to the Lord, and he even thanked the Lord for breaking him in places, for breaking him in places that he needed to be broken, for bringing things to his attention that needed to be brought to his attention. Because see, so many times we're going through things in our life and what do we think, oh my gosh, the enemy has me under attack. No, maybe sometimes God is just trying to get you under submission, mm. which is a totally different thing. Because sometimes we go about our lives thinking that we're in control thinking that it's my life and I can do whatever I want. And yes, we have free will. But to a certain point, because once we give our life to Jesus Christ, 
We have to surrender our free will to God and say, you know what, it's not my will, but your will be done. Didn't Jesus say that, being the Son of God mm. in the flesh? If there's any way that this cup can pass from me, let it be so. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We have to surrender our will to God because who knows better? See, he formed us in our mother's womb. He knew us before we were born. But then we get to a certain age and we think we know better than our parents and we know we think we know better than God, huh? right? Sometimes we just try to help God along and then we just need him with the small details, but we can take care of the big stuff. And so sometimes God allows things in our life to break us, to bring us to our knees. Because you know what? He would rather have some of our spiritual bones broken here than to have us be separate from him for all eternity. Because no one holy thing is going to enter the kingdom of God. We're, we're going to stand in his presence. We're going to stand in his presence in judgment. So this is where we need to be clean and wash, like King David said, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. So I described three horses. Which horse best describes you? The broke horse, and I don't mean money, okay? I mean, not, not broke like that. The broke horse, the one that has yielded to God. Have you surrendered completely to Christ? Do you allow him to take the reins of your life and lead you where he needs you to go? Have you allowed him to put a bridle in your mouth so that you can tame your tongue to speak words of love and not hate, to lift up and not tear down, to encourage and not to gossip and slander? See, they put bits in the horses of the mouth, and, and, and when the rider pulls on this, the reins, it tells the horse to go to the left or to the right or to go forward or to go backwards. See, we should allow that spiritual rein in our life, in our mouth, because sometimes our mouth gets us in trouble, and trust me, these last few days, I, I really had to allow God to ride in my mouth. Or are you the green heart, the green broke horse? Are you partially surrendered to Christ? But do you still buck when he asks you to do something? Do you still have bad habits because you refuse to crucify your flesh? Do you not fully obey the commands of God? Do the people around you need to approach you cautiously because you have a spirit of offense? Do you allow God to lead you only when you wake up in a good mood or you feel like it. <coughs> See, a lot of these horses that my dad broke in, there was days that he would go, and some of these horses, I don't know, they just woke up on the wrong side of the hay or what, but he would have a harder time that day. And sometimes we're like that with God. We come to the altar and we surrender our life to Jesus Christ, but then we don't allow him to fully lead us. Or does the dangerous horse describe you? You were not trained in the ways of the Lord, so you came to the cross of Christ, bolting, bucking, and rearing, and not really surrendering, but just looking for fire insurance. Do you still have very bad and dangerous habits? Then not even the most experienced pastor or counselor can help you break. Are you always looking for someone to blame for your actions? Have you really, have you never really allowed yourself to be broken by God like the dangerous horse? You don't mind God putting a roof over your head, food on your table, and water to drink, but just stay off of my back, basically. Stay off of my back. Don't tell me that it's not okay for me to stay home watching football instead of coming and worshiping the God that pulled me out of the pit of hell. Don't tell me about tithing. Don't tell me about serving. Don't tell me about the way I speak to my husband or the way I treat my wife. Don't tell me that. I don't mind coming here and praising God when I'm in a good mood, but you know what? When I'm not in a good mood, stay off of my back. Don't tell me how to run my life, Pastor. Don't tell me how to treat my wife. Don't tell me not to disrespect my husband because he disrespected me first. So I'm in my right. Don't tell me that. Just get off of my back. And sometimes we're like that dangerous horse that not even God can control. And then he puts a shepherd in our lives 
And I'm going to tell you this because I gave my life to Jesus at 14. And it was an amazing experience. But then came a day in church when I began to not like certain things that the pastor was bringing to my attention or that the Holy Spirit was bringing to my attention. So it was kind of like I would just, you know, tune it out. Wait till he gets to the good stuff. Like the good stuff that says that God has a good plan for us. That he'll open up the windows of heaven and he'll bless us. That he sends angels to surround us. We like that good stuff, huh? But when the Holy Spirit comes and says, hey, you disrespected your husband today. You need to ask for forgiveness. Or you know what? The way you spoke to your wife. That was in Christ like. You need to ask her for forgiveness. Then we start bucking and kicking and rearing and and then we start acting like those poor little kids or those wild horses that we don't mind that God takes care of us and we have a roof over our head that we can get up in the morning to a hot shower that somebody invented toilet paper and toothpaste. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You know, it's like, wow. But just don't get into my business. And sometimes we're like that. The broken horse is the most beautiful horse in God's eyes. Let's go to Job 39, 19 through 25. Job 39, 19 through 25. I love this scripture. It's so beautiful. The Lord is talking to Job. When you get a chance, go back and read like the first four, or five, the last four or five chapters of Job, where God is speaking to Job out of the world, and it's, it's amazing. But we're just going to read this part right now. Job 39, 19 to 25 says, Have you given the horse strength? Have you pulled his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He mocks at fear and he is not frightened, nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and javelin. He devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet has sounded. At the blast of the trumpet, he says, a hum. He smells the battle afar from afar and the thunder of the captain shouting. This is a horse that is being used in battle. And he doesn't fear anything. They're in battle and their spears, it says here, their spears and their javelins and, and their fierceness and rage. And you know what? The horse is still going forward and he says that he doesn't, he smells the battle afar off but he still runs towards it. Man, as Christians, if we would be like that, this world would be amazing. Amazing. This is a horse which God has control in the battle. And he's giving, painting a picture here of this horse that is being used in the battle. And if we, like the horse, like the wild horse, would let God break us from our bad habits, break us from pride, break us from anger, break us from unforgiveness, the amazing things that God could do. But you know what? Also, when we go into the battles of our life, we would go in with that fierceness and we wouldn't be afraid. You know what? We see the battle ahead, but we still continue running ahead. You know what? We're like the firemen because when there's a fire, everybody's running out, but the brave men are the ones that are running in, saving everybody else's life. And that should be a picture of us. We should be spiritual paramedics that are running into the fire to get those who are already burning in hell. But sometimes we think, well, as long as I'm saved, as long as I have a roof over my head, I have clean water to drink and I have food to eat, I mean, why should I worry about the next guy? That's not only pride, that's selfishness. Mm -hmm. And that's sin. We should worry about the next guy. We should see a homeless guy on the sidewalk and wonder, does he need something to eat? Does he need something to drink? Does he need a jacket? Does he need a cool water, maybe a hot coffee? 
Is there something that I can do? Maybe I can't change his whole life right now, but is there something that I can do in this moment? In this moment. There's been times where God has totally stopped me in my tracks. And I don't know how I happen to see the homeless man laying behind a bush on the side of a bank or a grocery store or whatever. It's just God gives me that vision. But I know God sends me there. I'm okay. I'm safe. And I can't change that man's whole life. But I can lift him up and let him know that I love him that day. And that's the beauty of allowing God to break us. But sometimes God is trying to give us carrots and apples and sugar cubes and do it the soft way, but we're that close, stubborn, prideful. So then he's got to allow harder things in our life so that we drop to our knees and realize that without him we're nothing, that we need him. Amen. You know, my dad would tell me when I was a little girl and I would get in a lot of trouble because maybe my mom was spanking me. But if my dad was going to spank me, it was not only hurt my body, it would hurt my heart because I was daddy's girl and I was just like, oh my gosh, my world was crashing to an end. But he would tell me, Mijita, we can do this easy or the hard way. I don't know why sometimes I chose the hard way so everything an option. <laughs> it's like, wow, it was like, mm, he ran about me there, then my bottom's still on fire. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't I say the easy way? You know, it was like, I thought he was going to have a little more mercy on me. But he was teaching me a standard that I should live by. Because sometimes what happens is we coddle our children so much that they can't get through life without us. If the Lord were to take us away today, I think some of our children would be lost and they'd be like, you know. But... My dad was a little bit harder on me, but it's kind of like my dad knew the struggles I was going to go through in my life because I would tell Dad, why do I have to be on top of the roof helping you with patch the roof? I have five brothers. Mm. And he thought, because you're going to go through stuff in your life, you, know, you need to know how to do this. It's like my dad knew I was going to end up being a single mom with two boys. I was going to have to get up on the roof and patch my roof sometimes. I was going to have to do my own air conditioner. I was going to have to know how to turn on my own furnace. And, and all that I know how to do now, you can ask Pastor. Winter's coming, I clean off the furnace, I turn it on, no problem. Summer's coming, I turn off the furnace, I get up, turn on the air conditioner. It, it's no problem, but my daddy taught me these things. He taught me how to survive in a world that sometimes can't be kind. You know, and, and, and I think many times God wants to, to break certain things off of us because sometimes we're a little too coddled or, or we get a little too comfortable. And then God is like, no, 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 let's not get comfortable. Because we get when we get comfortable, what happens is the enemy is sneaking up all around us and we can't even see him. So we need to keep our eyes open all the time. I'm not saying that you have to see a demon behind every bush, but I'm saying... Don't think they don't exist. Mm. Like a wild horse that will not be bridled, or a rebellious child who will not listen. God sometimes uses the troubles in our lives to get our attention and to tame our wild hearts. The God designed breaking of our unyielding hearts will break us and bring us to the point that is far beyond our ability to endure. He does this so that we will not rely on ourselves. So that we will come to the end of ourselves and realize that we need Him. God takes no joy in our suffering. It's our choice that brings consequences, and those consequences bring brokenness. Romans 8.28 says that God will make all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Not our purpose. His. God will allow the breaking of our carnal so that we will become spiritually strong. His breaking makes us whole and ready for battle. Much like the bone after being broken, the body will begin a healing process. If the two ends of the bones do not line up properly, the bone can heal with a deformity called a malunion. Again, 
I did something really dumb when I was young, and that's another sermon and another testimony for our day. But I ended up breaking 33 bones in my body. I was in a full body cast for 12 weeks. Then after they took off the full body cast, I was a partial cast. And then after they took off the partial cast, they found out that this wrist right here was not healing the way it was supposed to heal. And I still have like a bump here because they had to do surgery, go in, re-break the bone, and set it so that it could heal. Sometimes it still hurts. Sometimes I get cramps in it, but they had to re-break that this bone so that they could put it where it was supposed to be and so that it could re-heal. And, and I thank God they didn't put me a pin or anything. I remember the doctor saying, you know what, she's young. She's going to grow back the bone, you know, as long as keep her off of the roof and all of this other stuff. I mean, she'll be okay, but I was a tomboy. I was climbing trees, roof. I mean, you just name it. I was such a tomboy. So to be in a full body cast for 12 weeks, having my brothers tickle my toes with toothpicks and stuff like that, and you tell me when I got out of that cast, whoo, it was on. It was on. I know vengeance is the Lord, but I got a pretty good little portion of vengeance of my brothers. I love them. All of them are in heaven, not except one. Malunion fractures occur when the large space between the displaced ends of the bone have been filled by, by new bone. When the fracture heals in the position, in a position, it interferes with the use of the involved limb. Surgery is performed to correct it. X-rays are taken to determine exactly where the malunion has occurred, and then surgery is performed to re-break the bone and to realign the bone into position that improves the function of that extremity. Sometimes the bone may need to be trimmed and screws and pins may need to be used to align the bone properly. When we come to the cross of Jesus Christ, we're broken and we give our lives to him, but many times not our whole heart. Jesus begins the healing process but because we did not give our whole heart to him, there is a malunion that takes place and spiritual deformities began to occur in our lives. And we just can't seem to figure out what's wrong. A large space began to take place between us and Jesus because we allow false doctrine into our lives. By not studying the word of God for ourselves because we want to be spoon fed every Sunday. The re-breaking begins when the Holy Spirit x-rays our heart and finds that there are things in our lives that need to be trimmed away in order to bring us back to our first love, Jesus Christ. You know, I went through a lot of brokenness in my life. You know, I've had friends in my life who have told me, man, I wish I could have the dreams that God gives you. I wish I could hear God's voice. Like he speaks to you, I wish, I wish, I wish. But if you had to go through what I went through in my life, I don't think you would easily wish. It came through a lot of brokenness. It came through a lot of discipline. It came through a lot of correction from God. A lot. You know, it hasn't, it hasn't been easy. There's been times where, where I've been broken to the point to where even suicide was a thought. But then I just had to rely on what I had already learned in the Word, and, and I would hold on to that, and I would ask God, I mean, why are you allowing me to go through this work? Why? But now I look back in my life, and everything that I went through, all the hurt, all the pain, everything that I went through in my life, the beatings, the abuse, everything. Man, now I see how God has turned it around and is using it for good. Because I can, I can counsel women who are in situations of domestic violence, and maybe not even that bad. You know, maybe it's the point where, where once in a while the husband speaks to this person, this woman, the way they're not supposed to be spoken to, and I can, I can understand because I've been there. But I, and I know without a shadow of a doubt that abuse is not okay. So I will tell that woman, you need to get out. Either he needs to get out, or you need to get out of that situation because it's not okay, but I learned it the hard way. This was 12 years of getting my face beat in. It was 12 years of being thrown on the ground and being kicked and spit.
sit on and stab. I mean, there's brokenness. So before you wish for somebody else's anointing, you really need to consider what that person has gone through to have that close relationship with God because it hasn't come easy, I'll tell you that. It has not been easy. But through God's strength, sometimes I stop and I think and I think, God, you must have thought I was really strong to put me, uh, or not put me, but to allow me to go through some of the things I went through. Because was I stubborn? Yes, I was stubborn. I was stubborn headed. I was rebellious. But see, just like those wild horses, when I gave my life to Jesus, it could have been a lot easier. <laughs> A lot easier, but it was like my dad used to tell me, you're going to do this the easy way or you're going to do it the hard way. I always choose the hard way. I don't know why. I'm getting smarter. <laughs> but it was like that woman had asked Jesus, can my sons sit with you? One to the left and one to the right. And Jesus said, can they drink the cup that I want them to drink? Mm. No. No, none of us could have drank that cup. Absolutely none of us. But I look back now and I think, man, I remember I used to be so angry with God. Before I gave my life to God, I was so angry. Because when I was six years old, I drowned. I went to heaven. I saw heaven. I saw the streets of gold. I saw the river that was like liquid diamonds. I saw the throne of God. I saw the jewels. I saw the souls worshiping around the throne of God. I saw the angels. I saw everything. But God didn't allow me to go in. I had to come back because I hadn't fulfilled my purpose. So when I came back at the age of six and, and I was being sexually abused and I was being physically abused and all these things were going on in my life, going a bit hungry at times, I mean, having, having a difficulty learning in school because I would have to speak Spanish at home and English. And so then, I mean, they didn't teach Spanish, at, you know, in school. So I have a hard time grasping these things. And all these things began to happen to me since the age of six. And I remember I used to sometimes, even at that age, I would look up to the sky and I would say, is this what you sent me back for? Is this the purpose you had for me? What kind of God are you? That you know everything and you would send me back to go through this? And I would cry. I would cry myself to sleep many times and I would say, I must have done something wrong. Or maybe when I got to the door of heaven, God saw me and I wasn't pretty enough. Maybe because I didn't come from rich parents. I don't know. I just knew that a little girl that I was angry. And I would say, God, really? At the age of nine, I started drinking. By the age of eleven, I was an alcoholic. I used to steal from my mom's purse. I used to, my brother had a little shed in the back where he would work on cars. And I would go in there and still cans of paint to sniff. I would, his little roaches of my one that he had. And I'm saying that because it's legal now. Anyway, <laughs> but I would still empty bottles from the trash can in my brother's workshop and that, and just because that's the only thing that would quiet the demons in my mind. It was a hard cup to drink. So then at the age of 11, I started getting into stupid stuff because alcohol wasn't cutting it anymore. It wasn't cutting it when I would wake up in the middle of the night and I was afraid to move in my bed because there was stuff crawling on the walls. And I knew that these demons were just hanging around waiting to take me. I'm being truthfully honest as God is my witness. There's a black horse I would see in the backyard and he had feet like a goat, a body like a horse, and a face like a man. And he would stare into the bedroom window and he would look at me and he would smile and then he would take off running. 
The only one who believed me was my dad. Then at the age of 15, I got pregnant. My dad took us to the courthouse, made us get married. This man was an alcoholic, which later turned to cocaine, and he used to abuse me every day. And still then, I would say, really, God, this is the plan you have for me? Sometimes I would try to read the Bible and I would get so angry and I would just throw the Bible because it seemed like, and, and this is the enemy, he would blind my eyes to see, to not see what God wanted me to see and only to see what he wanted me to see. And, and, and I would read the Bible and I would say, really? King David did all this? But he had favor. All it seems like all the men in the Bible have favor. So you must hate women. And I was angry with God, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I was angry. But God can understand that sometimes. And then anger turned into hate. The person that was abusing me came out of prison, and by that time. I was a single mom with two boys, and I had already purchased a gun to defend myself. When I found out he got out of prison, I went straight to his house. I got out of my car, I locked the door. He came to the door, and I put a gun to his head, and I wanted to kill him so bad I could taste it. At that time, I was dating pastor, and he had gave me a ring. And I remember I was about to pull the trigger, and I don't know how this happened, because we were standing where the sun was not hitting, and the sun began to reflect off of my ring. And I remember looking at the ring, and I had my finger on the trigger, and I was shaking. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to express you to hell. I said, just tell me one more time what you used to tell me. Tell me. And I remember having so much hate in my heart. But somehow God made the sun shine on my ring, and the Lord said, I'm about to have things change in your life and you're going to go with it. What about your boys? Oh, I was so angry that I couldn't pull that trigger. I was so angry. I got in my car and I remember he ran to the car and I pulled down the window and I said, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. Don't ever look for me again. And I had so much anger, but the Lord had to break me to take that anger out. I had to be homeless with my two boys. I had to live in a shelter and stay awake all night to shoot the roaches off of my two boys. I had to fight, I had to struggle, but why? Because a lot of that was for my stubbornness. My stubbornness. You think that the Lord didn't come and tell me many times to, to put down the bottle of alcohol, put down that drug, what are you doing? The Holy Spirit was constantly pursuing me. The hound of heaven was telling me, I love you, I love you, I love you. But I had so much anger and hate and resentment in my heart that, that it seemed like God couldn't even break me. So it was okay, you want to do this the hard way, we'll do this the hard way. So because I refused to listen to God, he turned away and just said, you know what, have your way. Just, just go at it. But when you're ready, I'll be here. I'll be here. The time of carrots, apples, and sugar cubes was over. And the Lord really had to break that stubbornness, that anger, that unforgiveness, that thought of this is my life and I'll live it however I want. He really had to break me from that. And in the trenches, I learned to trust God. When I was sleeping in cars with my two boys, I had to learn to trust God. And it's a brokenness that can be so beautiful when you learn from it. And I know many of you in here have gone through experiences in your life that if you would look back and you would draw everything you can from those experiences and say, you know what? I already drank from that cup. I'm not going back. Things in our life have to change. When is Jesus going to be enough? When is Jesus going to be enough? 
You know, we had a person at one point in this congregation that so boldly came to Pastor and I and said, why don't you take down that cross? Maybe you'll attract more people. Mm -mm. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Because even though it wasn't this cross, there was a cross on Calvary that was put there. And that cross was waiting for my Savior who was bleeding and he was beat and he was hurt and the splinters that were going on his back from the cross. The pain. And read the Bible. It was a cold day. Because when they were trying him, they had a fire, and it says that Peter was warming himself by the fire. Getting beat like that hurts even more when it's cold. But the world was cold for Jesus since the day he was born in that stable because there wasn't room for him. But sometimes, like those wild horses, we don't make room for God in our lives. We want things our way. You know what? Hallelujah. Bless me. I need a new car. I need a new job. But just stay off of my back. And sometimes we treat God like that. And I'm telling you because I'm talking to myself first. When God would tell me to pray for the people that abused me, to pray for the people that hurt me, Oh, no, Lord, I love you. I'll read your word. I'll serve in church. I'll clean toilets and everything, but don't ask me for gifts because you know what they did to me. One day the Lord said, do you know what they did to me? Do you know what they did to me? And it was around the time the movie Passion of the Christ came out when the Lord spoke to me like that. I couldn't even finish seeing that movie. Not the first time. Because I remember watching what they were doing to him, and I was thinking. But yet he was hanging on that cross, and he said, "For God, oh God, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do." But yet everyone who had abused me didn't know Jesus. They didn't know what they were doing. So when God asked me to forgive with all of my heart. Little by little, I began to forgive, and there was only two people left in my heart that I was kind of refusing to forgive. And it was the person that abused me as a little girl and my ex-husband. Pastor is the one that got my attention one day and said, babe, we need to start praying for your ex-husband. We need to start praying for salvation. And when I heard that grace come out of his mouth, I'm like, wow. I don't know how to pray for him. I say, can I just hold your hand and you pray? He said, yeah. Let's pray. Because, babe, if you want the salvation of your boys, you're going to have to release him. You're going to have to pray for him. You're going to have to pray for salvation because whatever he did to you, whoever he was, however he was, he's the father of your two boys. And as I began to pray for him, me and Pastor began to pray for him, and at first, it wasn't from the heart. It was kind of like, oh, I hope he doesn't get hit by some my truck. That was kind of like my prayer, you know, but it wasn't to bless him or anything. But when I began to pray with all of my heart, the son that hadn't spoke to me for 10 years came to me and asked me for forgiveness. He gave his life to Jesus. He got baptized. He got married because he was living in sin. And now he serves the Lord. God's amazing. But sometimes he has to break us to the point to where we fall on our knees and the only place we have to look is up. See, sometimes we come to church and we can walk out those doors, and I'm talking to people here watching my Facebook too and YouTube, because I know that the Lord is piercing your heart with these words. Because sometimes we're like, God, give me an anointing. God, give me an anointing. But think about the anointing that King David got and all the things he got through his anointing before he got the appointing. And sometimes we forget about the things that we 
go through in between. But see, God is so loving and so patient. And right now the churches are empty and it's not just our church that's half empty. There's a lot of churches all over the world right now. But the Bible predicted it. In the end days, the hearts of men will wax cold. There'll be a falling away, the great apostasy. Nobody will want to hear the truth. Everybody wants to hear what makes them feel good. Get on Facebook and see. Everybody wants to hear what makes them feel good. Nobody wants the truth that's going to cut and break and change your life. Let me tell you, sometimes we come to church and we walk out those doors and we're nitpicking the pastor and we're nitpicking the message. And I'm like, you know what? The worship wasn't that good. And then when we sang that song again, or didn't we sing that song? I said, did you see what she was wearing? Wasn't she wearing that last week? And we go away empty. We go away leaving in the same, the same position that we came in. We walk out those doors leaving as empty as we came in. And why? Let me tell you why. But the Holy Spirit will never send anyone away empty unless you come in full of yourself. You leave your pride at the door. You check your status at the door. You check your money at the door because you're coming in the presence of Almighty God. And it shouldn't be, I didn't like that song because that song wasn't for you, newsflash. That song was because we're worshiping Almighty God from our heart. Because we're not here to entertain. We're here to bring forth the truth, no matter how hard it is to swallow. How many of you guys, when you were little, your mom gave you medicine that you were kind of holding your mouth for two or three minutes, hoping she would turn away so you can spit it out, but she would sit there until you swallowed. But then it would make you feel better, right? I know I had that experience. There's some SSS tonic my mom used to make me drink because I had an enemy as a little girl. And, whew, I never forget that stuff. <laughs> but I don't have leukemia. My mom was able to get my iron and my blood back to where it was supposed to be. See, sometimes the word of God doesn't taste good in our mouth, but it doesn't matter because the word of God was intended to come and change our heart. See, he doesn't want us to circumcise our bodies. He wants us to circumcise our heart. Circumcise, it means cutting off, taking away things that are not supposed to be there. Because if not, we're going to sit in church and we're going to be wondering, oh, gosh, man, the pastor really talking a long time today, and, you know, Golden Crown is going to get packed. We don't have our eyes on Jesus. And God, it can be so easy. If we come to the foot of the cross and you don't say, God, here's my pride, here's my stubbornness, here's my rebellion, here's these people that I haven't forgiven in years, here's the bitterness, here's everything, God. I want to walk out that door a different person. Break me. Let my bones rejoice in your breaking. Let my bones rejoice in your breaking. I rejoice now. I didn't see it then. But I rejoice now in the times that the Lord has not only broken me, but has really reminded me on a daily basis, Mijita, crucify yourself. Crucify yourself. Don't let these addictions take a hold of your life again. You know what? This chocolate bar might not be cocaine, but it's becoming an addiction. Mijita, crucify it. And he still reminds me to this day. These last two weeks, I've been going around trying to settle things with the insurance for my in-laws for all the tests he has and everything. Whoo! <laughs> you know, I have to sit there. Pastor was with me. You in the hospital it was yesterday or day before, huh? Mm. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I really love Jesus. Because old me would have jumped over that counter. But old me can't come out anymore because old me is crucified on the cross. See, we have to be a testimony. We have to be a testimony. Something happened during this time that my father and I, we found out he had cancer and something happened. It was a family member. I kind of spoke harshly to my mother-in-law, and she's my mom. I don't know about you guys, but you don't mess with mama. 
and my flesh wanted to take over. And I had to really crucify my flesh. It was hard. That one was hard. And I had to say, God, why is this so, so hard at times? Because that's my mama. But then the Lord put this person in our path a few weeks later. And we were able to minister to this person. But if I would have let my flesh take place when I wanted to take place, I would have done away with the testimony of Christ in my life. And I would have been able to minister to her. Because just like Jesus said, you say you love me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to challenge not only you guys in here, but I'm going to challenge all of you guys watching my Facebook and YouTube. What are things in your life that you should be asking God to break? What are things in your life that you should be purposing to break so that God doesn't have to? There's going to come a day that whether we believe in the sacrifice of Christ or not, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're going to confess it on our way to eternity with God and we're going to confess it on our way to hell. But we're going to confess it because he is King of King and Lord of Lords. Amen. And he breaks us for our purpose. He breaks us for our purpose. You know, something amazing happened today. Pastor was taking a training for work and he called me for his break and I'm thinking, isn't he supposed to be in a training? I'm hearing church in the background. And I'm like, are you hearing that? Are you in church? He's like, no, I'm in the training for work. Like, what's all that in the background? It's like, I don't hear anything. Are you sure? And I'm hearing the back, so I just start repeating everything I'm hearing in the back. Just be still and stand. Because those who are slandering you and, and, and belittling you and those who are coming against you, my eye is on them. I'm about to launch you to a place where you've never imagined. And, and just on and on for probably 10, 15 minutes. And I didn't even want to tag up the phone. I'm like, think there's angels ministering to you. I can hear what they're telling you. There's angels ministering to you. And, and I'm repeating everything that they're saying. But sometimes we have to ask God, 
And you know, in my prayers many times, I say, God, help me to disappear. I don't want Patricia to exist anymore. I want people to see Jesus Christ. I want people to hear Jesus Christ. I want you to be front and center of my life. And if I ever pray a selfish prayer, I thank you to not answer it because you know best. Bring my children, bring them to their knees. Don't let them have pride. Let them come down so low that they know that they need you all the days of their life. But protect them. If the enemy comes and asks you for permission to sift my children as sweet, I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ to deny it, but your hand be upon them. And you break the things in their life that need to be broken. The things that I can't see because I'm mom. They don't tell you everything. Break them. Break them. Because more than a cushy life for them, I want salvation. But when we start praying like this, God honors those prayers. And things in our life begin to change. Because brokenness can be a beautiful thing. When we allow God to take that malunion in our life and re-break us and put it back the way it's supposed to be. Don't wait for pastor to school feed you on Sunday. Pick up your Bibles. Learn the promises of God. Learn the things that are for you. But also learn the commandments. Learn what you're supposed to do. Learn how you're supposed to obey. Don't just take the word and say, oh, well, you know, that's a good word for my husband. I can't wait till he gets home from work. It's for you. <clears throat> it's for you. And as I begin to close, the one thing I just want to really bring home to you guys is that if we come to the foot of the cross on a daily basis and we surrender everything to God, then there's nothing left for him to have to rip out of our hand. But when you do this, even when the enemy is watching you, and the enemy wants you, and the enemy is chasing you. They're going to see that mantle and that anointing around you, and they're going to say, you know what? 